I want to uh, continue slash wrap up the, the lecture series this evening with two lectures, the first of which I want to talk about really why it is that the new identities, particularly uh, sexual identities, have become so strong and so powerful, dominant within the culture in which we find ourselves. And then in the final lecture, we reflect upon how the church might respond to this. Now, in a sense, there's, there's a bit of a leap I have to make this evening. Last night, I talked about the romantics. Today, I'm going to leap really to the, the present day. And I want to just give a little bit of filler to carry the story between those two points. Uh, broadly speaking, I think what happens in the uh, late 19th or early 20th century is that inner space, that set of inner feelings that the romantics identified, who so identified as being the real you and the real me, that expressive individualism comes to be seen primarily in terms of sexual desire. Uh, the key figure in this is Sigmund Freud, he's not the only one, but Sigmund Freud is the man who identifies uh, sexual desire as that which really drives human beings. And while uh, I would not want to go the sort of a full Freudian route, I think he's certainly onto something there. That for most people, sexual desire is one of the strongest things uh, that they experience and is uh, central often to how we think of ourselves in the world. So Freud, if you like, has the good fortune of coming up with an idea that has a powerful plausibility to it, even though it takes on a life of its own. So that's part of the story between where I finished last night and where I want to pick up this evening. The other thing I want you to bear in mind is this, and uh, I haven't had time to elaborate this, but uh, could certainly do so if, if asked during the question and answer session. I think it's, uh, it's true to say that all human beings uh, experience two things. Uh, one of them is we experience ourselves as free. Uh, we intuitively think of ourselves as free agents. By and large, uh, we are not like uh, beavers. Uh, we're not like Jack Russell Terriers. We're not like hawks. The beaver builds a dam. Jack Russell Terrier is just crazy. Uh, a hawk strikes with ruthless efficiency from great height when it sees its prey. But in none of those situations does the creature think about what they're doing. Using sort of contemporary language, we might say they're hardwired to do those things. They're instinctive. Human beings, we are free. I was not hardwired to go to the college that I went to. I wasn't even hardwired to go to college. I experienced my life as a, as a set of free choices. And that makes Rousseau's thinking. Man is born free in every way is in chains. That makes that thinking plausible in terms of my own experience. So I want to hold in mind that human beings are free, but we're not only free. We also want to belong. And I think one of the characteristics of human beings is we want to belong. We want other people to acknowledge us for who we are. Uh, I give a lecture on this at, at Grove. Uh, it's based on uh, the, the 18th, 19th century philosopher Hegel. Hegel is incredibly boring and incredibly tormented to try to read. So I don't call a lecture Hegel, I call a lecture Why Do All Teenagers Look the Same? And I teach this basic idea without ever referring to Hegel. Teenagers, there's nobody uh, who wants to express their freedom more than the typical teenager. They want to break free from mum and dad's tutelage, and it's a natural stage in their development. And yet, how do they express their freedom? They express their freedom by conforming to the dress sense, and the language, the idioms, and the behaviours of other teenagers. And it's a great example of where freedom and belonging sort of come together, we might say. And 
My argument, if I were to sort of summarise it in, about human identity and our current crisis, is this. Expressive individualism has turbocharged our sense of freedom and our desire for freedom. And yet, the traditional rules of belonging have pretty much completely collapsed. And that creates, to put it rather sort of simplistically, but still truthfully, I think, that creates a vacuum. When old identities cease to be plausible, where they've collapsed, new identities will emerge to fill that vacuum. One of the striking things about the trans phenomenon that the uh, country is witnessing, the Western world is witnessing at the moment, is how much of that is actually connected to young people wanting to belong. Uh, I heartily recommend Abigail Schreier's book. It's a very depressing book, but a very important book, Irreversible Damage, which is a study of the trans uh, phenomena among young teenage girls. And one of the striking things that Abigail Schreier, who is, from what I can make out, kind of, she's, she's a liberal Jewish thing. She's not your sort of arch-conservative by any stretch of the imagination. One of the things that's very clear in the narrative she tells there is that a lot of the trans phenomena among young girls is driven by the wanting to belong. Feeling themselves all at sea and wanting to belong to a strong community. So I want you to hold that in mind as we think about uh, the themes I want to address this evening. One of the striking things about the, the world in which we now live, it's not just expressive individualism. It's strange that at the very time that expressive individualism has emerged as the dominant way of imagining ourselves to be in this world, at the same time as that has become dominant, the notion of the world has changed as well, and the two things are closely related. We might say that we've come to think of ourselves as plastic people. We can be whoever we want to be, we can be whoever we think we are, we can be whoever we wish to identify as. We become sort of plastic. Well, the world has become sort of plastic or even liquid at precisely the same time. Engage in a little thought experiment. I think I alluded to this last night, but if, if I'd been born in the 14th century, I would have been born in a world that was pretty stable and fixed. Wherever I was born in the social hierarchy, whether I was born as a peasant, or a noble, or as heir to the throne, as a member of the royal family, that's where I would have remained. The whole notion of social mobility was unknown, really, in the Middle Ages. In all likelihood, given my own background, I would probably have been born uh, the son of peasant farmers. So my career path would have been determined from birth. Uh, the question that we ask kids today, what do you want to be when you grow up, would have been meaningless in the 14th century. Because the answer would be, well, I've got to do what my dad does. It's obvious because that's what his dad did before him, and so on and so forth. The world doesn't change. My geographical placement would have been fixed as well. I, I usually say I'm three and a half thousand miles away from my, my mother. I've no idea how far I am away from my mother. It's probably 6,000, 7,000 miles away from my mother at this particular moment in time. Had I been born in the 14th century, it's unlikely that I would have ever gone more than about 50 miles from home. And 50 miles would have been a long journey. 50 miles would have been a longer journey in real terms than the journey my wife and I engaged in on Thursday when we flew from Pittsburgh to Seattle. Everything I would need would be in the village in which I was born and lived and ultimately died. I would have had a very wide extended family that would have given me my identity. I would probably have met the girl I was to marry fairly early in life. 
I would have been baptized, married, and buried in the same church. And my children and my children's children would have experienced much the same. Sometimes I ask the students at Row, how would you think about having your career path determined for you like that as well? We wouldn't like it. I said, well, actually, in the 14th century, you wouldn't have cared. Because we only worry about things that we actually have power to change generally. If your career path is given to you, you don't lay, lay awake at night worrying about what you're going to do later in your life. My religion would not have been a choice either. It would have just have been the one church. Catholic church, the parish church. I wouldn't have had to choose the church I go to. There would have been no choice. And my life on an annual basis would have been shaped decisively by the rhythm of the seasons. I grew up in farming territory. Uh, even today, farmers have to calibrate their lives by the rhythm of the seasons. You cannot sow grain in winter and harvest it in spring. There are rhythms of the year set by the seasons. One is very dependent, if you like, upon the rhythm of nature to calibrate, to mark out the rhythm of one's life. Think about our world today. Mass transportation, migration, education, social mobility, technology, science, medicine. Each one of these things and more have served to make the world what I would describe as a much more plastic place than it was in 1400. I'll look at a few specifics in a few moments, but just remember what I talked about last night. I said the most important thing about the way you relate to the world is the way you intuitively relate to the world. And in the 14th century, you would have intuitively related to the world as fixed and authoritative. Today, we do not do that. I was born the son of a small town accountant and lived in Gloucestershire as a child. I attended what we call a state grammar school. Unlike my parents, I went to college. I gained an undergraduate and a postgraduate degree, and having worked for four previous institutions on both sides of the Atlantic, I'm now Professor of Humanities at a college in Western Pennsylvania. My fate was not set by the circumstances of my birth. My fate, as far as I experience it, has lain much more within my own power. Now, immigration may not be part of everyone's experience of life. But most people in the West today think of the world as much more flexible and malleable than they would have done in the 14th century. We might say the tendency today is we tend towards thinking of the world as more like Play-Doh than something that's fixed. Something over which we can exert our power and that's why I think, for example, when something like COVID comes along and we might say nature bites back, we don't have the imaginative resources really to handle that. The only response we can come up with is doubling our efforts to try to defeat this thing. And I even found the language of defeating interesting. We need to defeat this thing. To put it bluntly, the modern cultural imagination is one that sees the world as raw material to be shaped by the human will. The most important factor in this, I think, is technology. Think of the medieval farmer. His life was utterly dependent upon the soil available in his locale and upon the rhythm of the seasons. Today, irrigation means we can farm in the desert. Glass houses, insecticides, fertilizers mean that the soil and the seasons lack the omnipotence, the all-powerfulness that they once possessed. Nature's authority has not been eliminated, but it has been powerfully weakened in the way that we experience it. Same goes for medicine. Diseases that would once have been deadly can now be dealt with relatively routinely with antibiotics. I think it was Calvin Coolidge, whose son, uh, I think, died as a result of getting his foot blistered during a tennis game. 
that turned septic, gave me blood poisoning, and he died. I've never met any family that's been bereaved because somebody got a blister. Because we have antibiotics to deal with that kind of thing now. Geography is no longer the force that it was. Cheap transport, public and private, mean that distances once measured in days, weeks, or even months can be covered in a matter of hours. From agriculture to medicine, from automobiles to computers, technology, and it's important to grasp this point, is not simply a way of doing the same things faster. It fundamentally changes how we relate to and think about the world. It also, I think, reinforces the focus on the individual. Music is a great example of this. Think about music. 200 years ago, if you wanted to experience music, and music has been a perennial, as far as I can see, of all human societies throughout all history. It hasn't always sounded the same. But think about it. Music, 150, 200 years ago, if you wanted to experience music, it had to be live. And typically, it had to be communal. You had to play as part of a group, or you had to go to a concert. These days, of course, how do we experience music? Most of us experience most of the music in our lives, individually and on demand. What does that change about the way we think about this world? Well, it, it reinforces that individualism, doesn't it? You know, those of us who are sort of prog rock fans, you know, Spotify has killed the concept album. What a disaster. There will never be another wall by Pink Floyd or Dark Side of the Moon. Because now we just pick and choose the particular tunes we want. It particularly annoys me on Spotify, by the way. You can pull up a classical record and Spotify defaults to putting it on random play. No. It's, it's meant to be listened to in a certain order. But of course, now the customer is king. Even the way we experience music reinforces the centrality, the authority, the sovereignty of the isolated individual that plays to that expressive individualism about which I talked. The modern person, if the modern person considers himself or herself to be something that he or she can create for themselves, well, I would suggest that that notion is extended to the world now as well. We have extreme power over how we experience the world. The world is tending towards being stuff which we can mould to our wills. We might also notice, as technology sort of fuels and supercharges the individual, and undermines and weakens, at least in our imaginations, the authority of the world, the world, think about the collapse of traditional authority. Reformation. I'm a Protestant minister. Reformation, I think, was a great thing. But it was not an unqualified great thing. Freedom of religion is interesting, isn't it? Freedom of religion, the thing that Tocqueville uh, rightly noted as being very distinctive about the American experiment as opposed to uh, the Europe that he himself had experienced growing up. Freedom of religion is a great thing. I don't want to live in Iran. I don't want to live in China. I admire those who go there and work as missionaries. I want to live in a country where I'm free to worship, where I wish to worship, when I wish to worship, in the way I wish to worship. But freedom of religion comes with some cost. And the cost is this. The cost is freedom of religion, which stems from the fracturing, the fragmenting of the church at the Reformation. Freedom of religion tilts power in favour of the congregant. And tilts the church towards being a consumer item. We're talking over a Medina of uh, Martin Butzus uh, concerning uh, the true care of souls, uh, his Reformation. A book on pastoral care. And I was jokingly saying, you know, those are the days when a minister could refer to his congregants as barking dogs <laughs> and expect them all to turn up the next Sunday. Well, why could you do that? Because there was no choice. Now, of 
course, the minister chooses the wrong hymn, wears the wrong tie, wears no tie. Somebody is going to take up bridge and not come back. That's not the New Testament pattern of church authority. But it is the pattern of church authority in a culture where there are a vast number of churches. People have automobiles and therefore can pick and choose. When I was pastor, we excommunicated three people during my time as pastor. Every single one of them is unrepentant, and every single one of them is worshipping at another church. That's not New Testament Christianity. The fracturing of the church, the fracturing of the church has weakened the authority of the church. We could also add the traditional family to this. Long-standing elite critique of the family as oppressive and tyrannical has now found a ready outlet in popular culture. Movies, sitcoms, soap operas routinely present families as dysfunctional. At the same time, legal changes have served slowly but surely to undermine traditional family structures. No-fault divorce has dramatically cheapened marriage. Uh, it is a mistake to think that marriage was redefined in 2015 by Obergefell v. Hodges, the gay marriage decision of the Supreme Court. Marriage was actually redefined in 1970, a few hundred miles south of here, when Governor Ronald Reagan signed no-fault divorce into law in California. That's what redefined marriage. The family has been very much undermined. And the notion of the nation, the notion of the nation, of the nation is now under severe strain. Of course, the nation as we know it, the nation state as we know it, is a relatively modern invention. In America, it was invented in 1776. European nations really emerge after Napoleon in the early 19th century. But the nation state now faces serious difficulties. I mentioned last night the 1619 Project. Not interested in whether the 1619 Project is right or wrong, I'm interested merely in the fact it exists. It is presenting a serious challenge to the traditional narrative of American identity. It indicates that the idea of the nation no longer enjoys a monopoly on the national imagination, as it might have done 25, 30, 40 years ago. Same in my own country. When I was growing up, Winston Churchill was an unconditional hero. Now, of course, is he a hero? Or was he an imperialist racist? Again, not making any judgment on that question, so you see saying, it's interesting that those questions are being asked. Do countries such as Canada and Australia only exist because of the theft of land from and subsequent exploitation of indigenous people? that those questions being asked indicates the notion of the nation is under huge strain. And of course, immigration. I'm an immigrant. I have a vested interest in immigration. As birth rates drop in the West, we need people to work, of course. Immigration isn't going away anytime soon. But as more and more people come to a nation without being deeply immersed in the narrative of that nation, so the idea of that nation gets diluted and compromised. Religious institutions, family and nation, have been dramatically weakened. And yet think how important they've traditionally been for identity. When you ask people 150 years ago, who are you? They'd probably have answered with at least two of those three. They'd have told you about their family, they'd have told you about their nation. And if they had religious commitment, they'd have told you about their religion as well. When all three of those things are seen to be corrupt, or compromised, or no longer grip the imagination, what identities do people have? It's fascinating looking out of my hotel window. Uh, there was the American flag. And beneath it, there were two flags flying. One was the Canadian flag, I don't know why the Canadian flag was there. 
or maybe see the state flag. The other was the rainbow flag. Again, not making any statements on whether the rainbow flag is good or bad. Probably you can guess where I stand on that. But it's interesting. National identity juxtaposed with sexual identity. The nation has faded, even as sexual desire has begun to grip the imagination of people as a way to ground their identity. And we might say that the more expressive individualism takes off, of course, the more family, nation, and church will decline. Why do I say that? Because family, nation, and religious institutions typically require a sacrifice of the self of some kind. Uh, mentor and friend, Katrina will know I'm going to talk about uh, Samuel. Uh, he's long dead now. He was at the church where we met many, many years ago. Samuel was a Second World War vet. Uh, he and his wife, I think I'm right in saying, got married in August 1939. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler and Stalin invaded Poland. On September the 3rd, 1939, King George VI addressed the British nation and declared war on Germany. And shortly thereafter, Samuel, who'd only been married for a few months, enlisted and went abroad and didn't see his wife for six years. They were still married in the late 80s, but it was remarkable because by the time he came back from war, probably having seen things that nobody should ever have to see, six years on, he'd have been a completely different person to the one that she married. And yet he did it. Why did he do it? Because the nation gripped his imagination. And the self had to be sacrificed for that which was greater. That which was greater. As expressive individualism comes to grip the imagination, that which imposes limits or demands sacrifices of the individual will become less plausible. And that which affirms the individual in his or her desires will become stronger. Philip Reef, the sociologist, says, as expressive individualism gains strength, uh, two institutions will decline. He didn't focus on family, but I think family also requires sacrifice. He says, nation and church will decline, Hospital and theatre will increase because the alleviation of immediate pain and making you feel good will become the primary imperatives of human existence. So, authorities in crisis. Second thing I would say that has occurred that uh, tilts us towards the kind of chaos we see now is the last of what I call sacred order. What do I mean by sacred order? Sacred order is the grounding of the moral order in something beyond itself. I don't think Thomas Jefferson was a Christian, but I think Thomas Jefferson had some sort of deistic, basic belief that the world had a structure, human beings had a structure, that was given to them by God at some point, and therefore when he used that, what I consider to be lethal phrase in the Declaration of Independence, uh, the pursuit of happiness, he assumed happiness had a certain shape. Happiness was not for you to invent for yourself. Happiness had a specific given shape because it was somehow grounded in the idea that this world was not all it is, that this world rested on something sacred. Once you get rid of the sacred, the pursuit of happiness becomes, I think, a, a lethal, a lethal part of your legacy. Because the pursuit of happiness now means whatever makes the individual happy. And that puts every individual in the driver's seat, as far as what happiness looks like. Interesting thing about today's world is we are attempting to do something that has never been successfully done in society before. And that is, we are attempting to justify 
the moral order of our society, the way it works morally, purely on the basis of our society. You may not know anything about ancient Sparta or any classics at university. Sparta was a weird society. Uh, it was highly segregated. Men and women were segregated from each other. Uh, Sparta was a, a society committed to being militant and militaristic. And one of the weird things is, when a Spartan man married a Spartan woman, uh, in order to make the transition to hanging out with a woman easier, uh, the woman had to have her hair cut and dress as a man for the wedding night. It's weird. It's weird to us. And you can imagine a Spartan girl saying to her parents, why do I have to do this? This is weird. Well, the parents would have responded, it's the law. To which the Spartan girl would probably have said, I don't care if it's the law, it sounds weird. To which the Spartan parents would have said, ah yes, but the law was given to the first king like Ergus by the oracle at Delphi. And therefore it comes with the authority of the gods. And we don't get to change that. We now live in a society where, if you ask the question, why do we have to do it this way? We have no basis for justifying it whatsoever. Why is X wrong? It's just the social convention. We can change it if we need. We have nothing beyond our society to justify our society. That creates a system whereby moral codes are highly unstable. Again, many people think that uh, the key uh, ruling in gay marriage was Oprah Cafel v. Hodges, 2015. Actually, I think it's United States v. Windsor, 2030. In the majority decision in United States v. Windsor, the Supreme Court declared that the only reason for objecting to gay marriage was what is known as constitutional animus. Constitutional animus is a fancy way of saying irrational bigotry. In other words, the Supreme Court of the United States in 2013 said anybody who objects to gay marriage can only be doing it on the basis of irrational bigotry. No sacred order. It's no longer legitimate to appeal to something beyond the desires of society to justify the organization of society. So a collapse of institutions, a collapse of sacred order. I would also suggest the thing that really tilts us towards sexual identity, technology, the pill. What does the pill do? The pill allows women to take control of their own fertility, it allows them to sever the link between sex and pregnancy. It changes the context of sexual activity, and I would say it changes the sexual economy. Again, think about it in the 19th century. Guy in your late teens, early 20s, you want to sleep with a girl. What do you got to do? You've got to be clean, you've got to have a job, you've got to have future prospects. Because you can't afford to get a girl into trouble. Because if you do that, you have to marry her anyway. And her brothers and father might well come on you. Once the risk is dramatically mitigated, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to make any effort whatsoever. The context of sexual activity is dramatically changed. It becomes possible to imagine sexual activity as a pleasant, no-cost, recreational activity. Technology does that. Prior to the advent of cheap contraception, it was hard to imagine sexual activity in those terms. Once the pill comes along, it becomes increasingly easy. And when movies, pornography, etc., etc., come in and reinforce that message, it comes to grip the social imaginary. Pornography, too, is interesting from this perspective. We often think about the problem of pornography as being the exploitation of those involved or the way it fuels lust. I would also say that pornography preaches a vision of expressive individualism in an extreme form. What is expressive individualism? 
mean in terms of how you imagine the world? Well, the expressive individualist thinks the world is ultimately there to make them feel good. That's what other people exist for in the expressive individual world. To facilitate my feeling, my inner feeling of well-being. What does pornography teach you? Well, it teaches you that sexual activity is all about you. The activity of the people on the screen, the only significance it has is the pleasure and satisfaction it brings you who are watching. That's a philosophical message. It's a philosophical message consonant with that broader understanding of what it is to be a human being. The traditional Christian idea that sex is the seal on a unique interpersonal lifelong exclusive relationship between one man and one woman and therefore only has meaning in that context is not part of the philosophy of pornography. It's antithetical to that philosophy. To use a distinction deployed by the English philosopher Roger Scruton, pornography is about bodies, not faces. I teach this at Grove. I, 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 there's always somebody in, in the class at Grove who's getting married. And I'll say, okay, you're getting married next summer? Yes. I say, well, imagine you're there at the, you're waiting in front of the church. It's a guy. And uh, suddenly you hear the music playing. And you know she's arrived. So you turn around to look at her, because she's the person you're there for. And you, you, you know, you're waiting for Jill to appear at the door. And the music changes and you turn around and you look, and it isn't Jill. It's Alice. And Alice is just as beautiful as Jill. And you can sleep with Alice. Do you go through with the wedding? And the answer was this, no. I said, why not? Well, because I want to marry Jill. I want to marry Jill. I don't want to marry a body. I want to marry a face. That's the Bible's philosophy of love and marriage, I think. People are not sexually interchangeable because they're not bodies. They're faces. Pornography is teaching a lot of bad things to a whole generation or two of people growing up on it. But perhaps the most lethal is this, and it's the one that we don't think about. It's teaching people to think about others as bodies for their pleasure, rather than as faces. The final point in this lecture is this. We also live at an interesting point in time where the people who are responsible for the transmission of values from one generation to the next are now committed to the destruction of those values. One of the things that's interesting about culture is this. Typically the elites in culture, and elite is now a bad word, I'm not using it in a bad sense here. Cultures have elites. They have teachers, they have leaders, they have artists and poets, etc., etc. Traditionally throughout history, those elites, those cultural, political, educational elites have seen their role as transmitting the values of society to the next generation, sometimes with necessary and appropriate modifications. But there's always been an emphasis upon continuity. Now, we see iconoclasm everywhere we look. The role of the elites, as the elites understand it now, is not of preserving the authority of the past in some form and transmitting it to the future. It's in shattering the authority of the past. We see it in art, we see it in music, we see it in politics. The political drive on the left to overthrow traditional notions of sexual morality and human identity. We see it on the right, the populist right with its rhetoric of contempt for traditional democratic institutions. In some ways, they're two sides of the same coin. They're burning to the ground by contrast. It's interesting uh, when Bernie Sanders pulled out of the, uh, the race, I think in 2016, a significant number of his supporters shifted to supporting Donald Trump. 
which is very counterintuitive if you just look at it as a straight right left fight, but makes sense if you see it as an establishment, anti establishment kind of fight. The elites have become very anti establishment, it seems to me. Education. Universities, colleges, now even increasingly in high schools and below, is permeated with the politics of identity. Committed to doing what? Demolishing. Demolishing the historical narratives upon which identity is being built. The world of art and entertainment is much the same. Corporate business, for many years identified in the West with conservative political causes, is now in the vanguard of radical progressivism. One can debate the reasons for this, but one cannot deny the reality. Think of 2015 when the Indiana State Legislature tried to pass a relatively mild Religious Freedom Restoration Act bill, and corporate America effectively shattered shattered that bill that was going to be passed by a democratically elected set of representatives. And then think about, put all of this together and go back to where I started. We want to be free, but we also want to belong. The traditional terms of belonging, family, church, nation, not only weakened, slowly and surely being buried before our very eyes. That leaves a huge vacuum. A huge vacuum at the very moment where the notion of what it is to be an individual is becoming very, very open. Radically individual. What does that lead to? I think it leads to two things. One, it leads to tremendous anxiety and it leads to people grabbing hold of new identities in a desperate attempt to belong. Isn't it interesting, I teach at Grove City College, most of the kids in my classes come from good homes. Not spectacularly well-off homes, but good homes. Most kids in my classes, you know, mum and dad have stayed together. They come from stable homes. Yet at Grove City College, 40% of our kids will go to the counselling centre at some point, either for themselves or for a friend. During their time at Grove, 35 years ago when I was at college, I'm sure my college had a counselling centre, but I never heard of it, and it certainly never crossed my mind to go. Is it because today's kids are snowflakes? I dislike that term intensely, actually. I think it's very condescending towards young people. They're not snowflakes. They're growing up in a world where my generation tore away all the normal means of belonging. And they're all at sea. It's not surprising they're anxious. And therefore, it's not surprising that they're now attracted to new identities that allow them to feel that they belong and are valued. And that's what I want to pick up in my final lecture when I think about how might the church address the kind of identity chaos that we see emerging in the world around us.